We need to investigate why lowering DT helped. So we can understand the code, but also because we should try to make S as high as possible for com computational efficiency. Because a higher S uh, yields a higher DT, which means fewer time steps to cover the same amount of seconds for the simulation. Since we have a very basic FDTD code with only free space, there aren't a lot of possibilities for why a lower DT is needed. So let's think about how we developed the value for DT for our one-dimensional model. In the lecture for module FDTD3, we determined that the stability limit of the one-dimensional code and also the required grid resolution for accuracy by comparing the analytical dispersion relation with the numerical dispersion relation. Here is the analytical dispersion relation for an, an, an electromagnetic wave propagating in free space, which is why we have C here, that we developed in module FDTD3. What we could do here is we could go through the same process. The analytical dispersion relation is not going to change. This one right here is not going to change whether in, we're in one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions. But for a two-dimensional FDTD model, the numerical dispersion relation will change between uh, one dimensions, two dimensions, and a three-dimensional grid. So numerical dispersion relation ch changes between one and two and three dimensions. To develop the two-dimensional numerical dispersion relation, we would plug the two-dimensional numerical solutions for the field components into the two-dimensional update equations. This is analogous to what we did in one dimension. I'm not going to go through all those steps here, though, because it's quite tedious in two dimensions. What we'll do instead is we'll be able to use the dispersion relation we got in one dimension in order to develop the dispersion relation for two dimensions. The equation that we ended up with in module FDTD3 is shown here. We solved this equation for omega tilde so that we could see under what conditions omega tilde would become a complex number. That threshold where omega tilde, the, the tilde of course means it's a numerica, a numerical angular frequency, the threshold where it changed from a real number to a complex number became our one dimensional stability limit. But we had actually simplified this expression right before we came up with this expression. We had simplified it uh, where on the left side we had squared the entire expression and on the right side we had also s a squared expression. So the corresponding equation for two dimensions will have the same form as this one, but it will have an extra term involving delta z. So here I'm going to write C delta T over delta X and sine K tilde delta X over 2. This is all squared and I'm going to add on to here another term that has the same form C delta T but we're going to have delta Z and sine K tilde delta Z over 2 and that is squared. Otherwise, the right side is the same, sine squared omega tilde delta t over 2. Also, another difference is that instead of k tilde, we're going to split k tilde into kx and kz components. In two dimensions, we can visualize the k, the numerical wave number, as a vector pointing in the direction of propagation. Then kx tilde is the component of k along the x direction, and kz is the component of k along the z direction. So this would be equal to k sine of phi, if I define this as being phi, and this would be k cosine phi. If we then move the terms in this equation around in order to solve for this one, just as we did in one dimension, then we get the two-dimensional numerical dispersion relation that's shown here. 
This two-dimensional numerical dispersion relation is definitely not the same as the analytical dispersion relation we got earlier, which is plus or minus c times k. That is, the numerical dispersion relation does not show a simple linear relationship between the angular frequency and the wave number, as we have for this analytical case. Also, as for the one-dimensional case, we can see that in this expression for the numerical angular frequency, we can run into trouble if we have to take the arc sine of a quantity that is greater than 1 or less than minus 1. Since we would then wind up with a complex number for the omega tilde. If we assume that for the moment that k tilde is real, so we're going to assume k tilde is real, which is also what we did in one dimension, then we can say that this is a real number and this is a real number. And that these values would also only range from minus 1 to 1 once you evaluate those. If we set them both to their maximum value of 1, what we would need to do in order to guarantee, so here we want to guarantee omega tilde is always a real number, then in order to do this we would have to ensure that what's left under the square root, which is c delta t over delta x squared, the sign is set, the sine expression is set to 1. So then we have this, c delta t over delta z squared. We need to guarantee that this is always less than or equal to 1, so that when we take the arc sign, we'll get a real number. So now try solving this expression for delta t, because then you will have solved for the maximum time step increment that we're allowed to use in a two-dimensional FDTD code.